and Chair of Cardiac Surgery uh, at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, who received his MD degree from uh, University of Ottawa in 94 and his Royal College in Cardiac Surgery in 2000. Uh, subsequently pursued a combined fellowship in minimal invasive surgery and laboratory research at Harvard University, where he also received a master's in public health. Uh, Dr. Ruel is a professor in the Department of Surgery, as well as a, as a uh, professor in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Uh, a seasoned heart surgeon, innovator, and researcher, Dr. Ruel is widely credited with the development of minimal invasive multivessel uh, cabbage worldwide and with furthering other minimal invasive cardiac techniques. Uh, the laboratory research program founded by Dr. Ruel at the beginning of his career has achieved uh, quite a bit of translational impact as well. Uh, he has published over 400 scientific papers and book chapters uh, with an author age index of more than 60 and is a recipient of numerous academic and community awards uh, and was recently featured as one of the giants of cardiothoracic surgery. Outside of his surgical and academic achievements, Dr. Ruel is the president of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, one of the most respected medical societies in the world. And since the CSCS was established in 1947, only three other surgeons have held this role. Dr. Ruel is the Canadian director for the STS and the surgical editor for the Journal of Circulation. And I can say that he is the only one who made me stutter and sweat during my residency interviews as well. Uh, and to this day, I'll remember that. So, Dr. Ruel, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule um, to give us this talk. And uh, well, thank you. Take it away. Thank you very much, Saurav. And I hope you don't hold it against me. Uh, we uh, So this evening, we really have a lot of great people on the call. I want to thank you first and Abby for putting this together and the CSCS. I know Rakesh has been uh, helping very much behind the scenes. And there's a lot of friendly names who I see here uh, from coast to coast and first starting east with Newfoundland. I see Dr. Daniel Lodge and Dr. Sean Connors and Dr. Ann Williams. And I see Kate as well. And as well, I think uh, I see also Jennifer Matthews uh, and many, many people coming from uh, one coast to the other. So Roxanne, Rodrigo, Piroz. Who's here? So Piro's, uh, who uh, requires no introduction, who was recently a great coup for the uh, Toronto General Hospital or UHN to to bring from Leipzig uh, and to Canada. So really a brain gain for Canada. Charles, Rand Forgy, welcome, Rand. Good to see you, Jennifer. Again, uh, Andy O'Connell, Charlotte, Amin, Christian, Danielle Holloway, uh, Ming, who's our chief resident extraordinaire, who did a couple of highly challenging cases today and is done in time. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, I, I'm just there as a bystander when he does multi-arterial op-cap surgery. Eowyn, uh, Trent, Therese, Ali, and or new uh, Newfoundland star surgeon as well. Uh, star surgeon Donna May Kimilarjak, who is a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful trainee from a program. We're very proud uh, that she's uh, uh, establishing her leadership leadership in Newfoundland as well. And Mimi and uh, Tina Power and uh, Peter Vo, our resident extraordinaire, Devin and uh, Ezwarda and Kate and many, many of you. I think uh, I'm going to go through uh, 50 names, but I think it's important to highlight the engagement of Canadian training. Neboja, jean Alexandre, uh, and Robert Bixby was our PGY1 and Max, who we referred to earlier and Nitin. So, I think I've gone through everyone and uh, I really want to thank you this evening because I think this is an important talk um, and I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Because um, I think it's time that we move away from conventional heart surgery and those of you who are cardiac surgery residents, there's no question that non sternotomy approaches are part of your future, whether you like it or not. Uh, I'm not saying that this operation that we'll talk about this evening is the operation that you'll be doing, but it will be some iteration, some relationship to non-sternotomy approaches as we will hear uh, this evening. So thanks again for the invitation. I think it's very opposite. There's no more important audience than Canadian trainees, in my opinion. Uh, so I, I feel very privileged uh, to be amongst you this evening and, and talk about how to learn less invasive bypass surgery. So, the relevant disclosure to this presentation is the following. I'm a proctor for mixed cabbage and mixed valves with Medtronic. 
and also uh, Medtronic has supplied funds in a in a non in a non um, a directive manner for the mistrial, which I'll talk a little bit about. So why minimal invasive coronary bypass grafting? Essentially, there are two main, uh, whether the perceived or real is open to debate, problems with bypass surgery. The first one is the pump, what our patients call stopping the heart. And, you know, I put a question mark there. Does it lead to complications or not? It probably does sometimes. Uh, it's probably not ever enough to be captured in uh, with a chi-square or Fisher's exact test. But once in a while, you know, you have a, someone who has a pump lungs or a cannulation uh, site aortic dissection or something like that. And the second one is the sternotomy, which is cutting the breastbone, which leads to invasion, definitely. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So I must disclose also that I don't believe that this is progress in coronary bypass surgery. I think this incision is great. It's wonderful for the team. It's wonderful for the surgeon. It gives you unrivaled exposure, but it's not great for the patient. And you can actually put quantification on this. How long does it take to recover from bypass surgery? So there's been many quality of life analyses that have been performed, one of which, for instance, was published in JAMA. I mean, it is a high impact analysis uh, from the Freedom Trial. The 1900 patients or so from the Freedom Trial were then followed with regards to quality of life indices. And Essentially, what they showed, remember, there were freedom. Uh, one group received PCI for, they were all the patients with diabetes, and one group received coronary bypass grafting. They all had multivessel disease, and there were no left main stenosis by protocol. But anyways, those patients who received uh, cabbage had better freedom from angina frequency early on, which then um, really surpassed uh, PCI from about 12 months and one and two years or so. However, there was a physical limitation price to pay ready in those patients. And you can see here, those negative values are favorable to PCI with a significant p-value. So up to six months and somewhere between six and 12 months, the physical limitation of cabbage is actually catching up with undergoing PCI. When you put it, this all together, you can see that the SEQ derived quality of life is actually takes about, you can see those empty circles here being C PCI versus the full circles being cabbage. Sometimes between six and 12 months, quality of life, despite better angina freedom, gets better with PCI, uh, with cabbage than with PCI. So there's really, when you tell patients, and our cardiology colleagues would know, when you tell patients that it takes a month to recover from bypass surgery, it's not true. I think here on our call, Dr. Dr. Williams, Dr. Connors would attest uh, to this fact that it actually takes much longer than that to heal from a sternotomy. So speaking of sternotomy, what are the issues with sternotomy? It, does it heal well in everybody? Again, we're surgeons. We often uh, may not see our patient beyond 30 days post-op uh, uh, and there have been studies that have been performed with regards to union and sternal healing with regards to freedom from post-operative pain. And those studies essentially remember the figure around 30% or so. Uh, this is an analysis of sternal healing after median sternotomy in low-risk patients in Asia. So these were not patients who had bilateral IT grafting or anything like that. And essentially at 18 months, 34% of those patients had significant mal or non-union of their sternum. Similarly, the multiple trials that have been performed looking at sternal closure with rigid plate fixation versus wire surclage have also uniformly shown at least around 30% malunion with sternotomy at six months or even beyond. Now, if you were to look at pain uh, from a chronic post-sternotomy point of view, after cardiac surgery, it's actually an old study from 2001 from Scandinavia, but it showed interestingly in a very robust fashion that 13 months after surgery, there's about 28%, again, remember the 30% of patients are not healing well, of patients who have post me chronic pain and need to do something about it. So this is not an incision that is great for patients. It may be great for us, but it certainly is a huge part of the invasiveness associated 
with cardiac surgery. Yesterday, we had one of our nurses who underwent a uh, appendectomy, laparoscopy, and she went home the next day, right? I mean, we don't have this yet in cardiac surgery. And the burden associated with the sternotomy incision, as you know, is not minimal. Despite cases that go really well and have minimal pump time and, and really slam dunks, as we like to say. So in that regard, we haven't done a great job as cardiac surgeons, unfortunately. Uh, this is a bit of a joke, this slide, and my kids love it because they, they see where the rats are inside the trunk of the snake, and you don't really know if you're going towards the exit or towards the tail of the snake. And bypass surgery, you could argue, has unfortunately faced about the same issue. Um, 1988 operation, heart-lung machine, sternotomy incision, big incision, and essentially you could say that now it's the same incision and the same operation except that we're using more arteriographs. It hasn't changed that much from an invasiveness point of view. So because of that, as you all know, society is willing to accept suboptimal results in order to avoid major surgery. You can be sure that if everything else is equal, patients will prefer to have PCI or even as of recently, medical therapy in order to avoid major surgery. And who can blame them, frankly? So our goal really when developing mixed cabbage was to decrease invasion and do this mostly through the avoidance of the sternotomy incision. I often say it's a bit of a simplistic thing, but you know, we're doing sternotomy in patients who have osteoporotic processes going on, whether they're male or female. Uh, when you're in your 70s and you have a little bit of loss uh, of bone density, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to heal an incision in your breastbone, breathing 18 times a minute with complete satisfaction, right? So I think it's a pretty much a no brainer that many of you, you would agree is logical. So what is mixed cabbage? Essentially, it can be six different things. It can be conventional or it can be robotic. And within those, it can be a single vessel approach or a complete approach, or even a multi-vessel hybrid approach. For instance, you would do two arteries on the left heart, and then you would, uh, you would move on to completing the reverse with stenting or so. So at the time, really our question back in the early 2000s was how can we preserve the safety and effectiveness of bypass surgery in a less invasive operation that someone can learn and perform routinely? So the premise behind mixed cabbage is essentially the following. If you make a small thoracotomy incision, usually in a male under the nipple, and you're about one intercostal space cephalid to the apex of the heart, you have access to the lita, the aorta, and the apex of the heart, and you can move the apex of the heart around and be able to reach all myocardial territories, including the diaphragmatic surface to graft the PDA and the lateral wall to graft the circumflex branches. So this was actually probably your second patient. This is a picture from 2005. Uh, the retractors at the time did not even exist and had no company name on it, which, which will be different from some of the pictures you'll see later. Um, and essentially, this, these were the very first iterations. We're using mid-cab retractors. But as you can see, compared to a mid-cab, the incision is more lateral. And the takedown from the left internal thoracic artery is much more complete, going essentially from the subclavian vein to the bifurcation. And essentially, again, depicting the more lateral incision uh, with the presence here of a apical positioner being put on this particular image under the xiphoid in order to move the apex of the heart around and be able to access all myocardial territories. So people often ask me, what do you need for multivessel bypass through a thoracotomy? So essentially you need about six things. You need a retractor system that works for you. I'm showing here the Medtronic and you're aware of my disclosures. That's the one I work with, but there are several companies uh, that can provide you with this. Next, you need some way to be able to use, for instance, a chest tube incision and stabilize the epicardium uh, where you're about to graft your vessel because you need stabilization, you need precision in your surgical anastomosis. Three, you need to be able to move the apex of the heart. It's actually not the apex. I like to say that the concept of an apical positioner is a misnomer. You're really 
the, those cardiac positioners, better name as such, you place in line with the vessel to be grafted around four centimeters, three, four centimeters distally to the site of your anastomosis. And that's from that site uh, that you're able to mobilize the heart in the position that you need. So this, for instance, would be retracted towards the right hip to expose the lateral wall of the patient's heart and towards the left shoulder to expose the diaphragmatic surface, i.e. the PDA of the patient's heart. You need a good surgical eye, definitely. This is not uh, a, a basic surgery. This is a very advanced uh, reconstructive coronary surgery. You need capable hands in, in, in the same token. And probably most important of all, a great surgical team. Uh, you need someone uh, starting with the anesthesiologist and your assistants who will, who will help you uh, achieve this and your administration as well, because they need to be supportive. Uh, your first triple vessel bypass case may take six hours to achieve. It certainly did for me. It probably took seven, eight hours, took the whole day. Uh, but I had a supporting chief at the time, uh, Dr. Messana, who was basically saying, just watch it. And at some point, you're going to be asking for these cases to be performed. And that happens uh, almost on a daily basis uh, from cardiologists who are referring for this operation. So I like to subdivide complex operations in chapters, if you will. And for mixed valves, there's typically three chapters. For mixed cabbage, there are four chapters. And they're not all of equal duration, but they're equally important, obviously. Uh, I just find if you look at the whole thing right from the get-go, it becomes almost intimidating. It's a little bit of thinking about your week, your busy week coming up, and, and thinking about all the things you have to do. You really have to go one by one. And I find during a complicated operation, this helps me as well. Perhaps it helps you. So I, I like to subdivide mixed cabbage by positioning, taking down the liter, taking the proximals, performing the proximals, and then performing the distal anastomosis. So the first part is really um, positioning the patient, and that's an important part. Uh, on Monday, we had a case. Uh, uh, Peter and Robert, who are on this call, uh, were my assistants, and they did a great job. And, and I really emphasize to them, you, you have to see how we position the patient, because it takes an important five minutes of your day and, and you want to make sure that you have the right exposure and, and gravity helps uh, and positioning and keeping the patient close to where you're going to be intervening is also important. So I use about a 20 to 30 degrees uh, right decubitus and when asked where do you make the incision, essentially it's a bit of a triangle between the sternal angle, not the sternal lodge, but the sternal angle and the xiphoid process. And 95% of the time, this will give you uh, the right intercostal space. So I don't do CT scans for you up. I don't count ribs. I just go according to this triangle principle. I mean, you may want to choose uh, to perform CT scans or look for maybe an intramyocardial LED, et cetera. It works. Ready, uh, do what works for you. But in my practice, I find that this is helpful. So an example here, uh, marking the sternal angle here, marking this, the xiphoid process, and essentially making a triangle, as you can see here, being equidistant from both. And that usually gives you the space that you're going to go in. Essentially, when you open, you want to be, as I was saying before, one intercostal space above the apex. If you're right on the apex, you're going to be too low. It's going to be very difficult to get onto the ascending aorta to do your proximal anastomosis. Uh, so as soon as I come in, I usually put the finger and, and really feel, uh, without opening the pericardium, where I am. Uh, compared to the apex. And there's really, uh, I want to emphasize this, there's no crime uh, and the patient doesn't really see the difference at all uh, to use a different intercostal space through the same skin incision if you feel that you're not quite in the right space. Um, Pierrot's would notice, uh, we have colleagues in India who have undertaken this operation. I remember one in particular who every time he does this operation, will systematically use the fifth and the third intercostal space and do his proximal anastomosis from the third uh, directly onto the ascending aorta and then do all the rest, all the distals from the fifth. Uh, I don't think you need to do that, but it's again, I want to emphasize, it's not a, a big problem if you have to use two spaces or move up or down one space. So again, showing you more of an HD uh, movie of putting the finger in and feeling uh, where the apex of the heart is as soon as you do your thoracotomy. So first chapter is complete. You've positioned, you've incised, you know which space you're in. 
and, and you're using you're, you're through the right space the next is to find the left internal thoracic artery there are two ways to find it and start the dissection you can find it medially so at the medial intercostal space that you've just opened so i.e through your thoracotomy incision without putting any tension on the retractor or you can do what i call finding the middle of the lita if you will you can put some upward and leftward traction onto the retractor not here and on the upper right hand corner but rather on the lower right hand corner pulling towards the left side of the patient opening that space and you will see the lita across the endothoracic fascia uh, being there and then start your dissection there going both cephalid and caudal later so this is an example here uh, i usually take my it's a pedicle when i do this i the paresthesias are not a problem and you don't get infections. Uh, when I do robotic uh, mixed cabbage, I do it skeletonized. Go figure, but there are many reasons for that, and I'll, I'll allude to that uh, in a few minutes. So you can really take down uh, the elita in a complete fashion. You can progressively dissect it all the way to the subclavian vein and down to the bifurcation. A little trick to get it down about at least one intercostal space caudal to where your thoracotomy incision is, is to put the arm of the retractor onto the lower aspect of your thoracotomy retractor. So you can lift and have a better view of that uh, more, set, more, more caudal portion. So here showing you again the, the lethal. Often at the end, you have a few medial attachments that need to be taken down. And as you can see here, I've put methylene blue on the anterior surface of the lita, which really helps uh, because it will go at the apex of the lung and, and only be used in most cases uh, towards the end of the grafting procedure. So you, you want to make sure that your letha is not twisted, which is one of the reasons why I like to have it pedicled as opposed to skeletonized. So chapter number two is complete. Uh, Piroz is on the call this evening, uh, would uh, typically take a, a Rita as well. When I do multiple arterial grafts, I prefer to use a radial artery. It's really personal preference. Uh, but uh, the next step is to do uh, source your, your grafts, if you will. I like to use the sending aorta. Uh, Piros, with whom we've collaborated, and again, who's on this evening, uh, would use a Y or T graft based approach. This works as well. And really, the point here is we, we don't want to be like a mitral repair or aortic surgeon or aortic repair surgeons of the 1980. We want 1980s. We want to embrace each other's techniques because the point here is we want, we have to make coronary surgery as robust, as effective, but less invasive. And we have to work together as a community uh, towards this. So uh, the first part here was really um, to put a lot of pericardial stitches in order to bring the ascending aorta towards the thoracotomy incision. Really from that point on, chapters three and four, the thoracotomy incision becomes a window, if you will, uh, through which you bring the structures that you need to expose and graft upon. So I put a lot of pericardial stitches, sometimes up to 12. And, and then once that's done, you've brought the, the aorta in, in, into the field. And then I like to put a gauze in front of the, of the superior vena cava, so on the right lateral aspect of the aorta, again, this gives you another six millimeters in terms of bringing the aorta towards the left side and towards you. And then I use a, uh, uh, a, a um, RVOT retractor, essentially the octopus, which I'll show you in the next high resolution image uh, to bring down the pulmonary artery or right ventricular outflow tract towards the lower left side and essentially bring the aorta towards you. And then you can clamp into your proximal. So showing you this in a high resolution fashion, here are the pericardial stays, uh, and you can see uh, the aortal pulmonary artery. Put a lot of those, eight, 10, 12, add them until you see that really they're not adding anything uh, in, in terms of exposure. Then putting the gauze, uh, on the right lateral aspect of the ascending artery, so in front, uh, anterior to the SVC, which again gives you a few millimeters. But you can see again, the ascending artery is not, not close, right? I mean, it's under the retractor and it's not like you would do uh, two or three 601 anastomoses with that. So it needs to get better. So that is a little bit of the coup de grace here. 
of putting this uh, epicardial stabilizer onto the RVOT pulmonary artery uh, junction and bringing things towards you. And that really opens up the PA in front of the aorta and brings down the aorta towards the left caudal uh, direction so that you can then put a clamp on it. And you can see now you can side bite it. Uh, you know, side biting is um, met with some skepticism by some. Uh, we'll look at the outcomes of mixed cabbage later. Uh, I routinely use side biting uh, and with excellent results with very, very few strokes. We had an m, &M in Ottawa about a year ago and, and the stroke rate with off cabs performed by side biting is less than half of 1%. So I think you have to select your patients. Obviously you don't do it in someone with aortic atherosclerosis, but in, in a regular patient, you adhere well if you place your uh, and you allow for air to be uh, escaping uh, under your suture uh, this is a very, very safe technique. And once you, you, you've, you've crafted your proximal anastomosis, essentially I like to mark the anterior surface of them uh, so that you, uh, again, don't risk twisting because it's very hard to see the entire length of your graph all at once through a four or five centimeter incision. So last chapter, essentially performing the distal anastomosis. So showing you from the uh, ceiling camera the marking of the grafts and their anterior surface. And then essentially I opened the pericardium in front of the heart. I tried to aim at going in front of the LED and opening it from right there. Uh, so removing some fat of the pericardium and, and making my way all the way to the diaphragmatic surface. So in this particular patient, we're gonna start with PDA. So we're putting a, a armless starfish and you can see here in line with the PDA vessel retracting towards the left shoulder and being able then to put an epicardial stabilizer and graft the PDA. So it's a small real estate as you can imagine, but you end up seeing the PDA really, really well and you can graft it. So my graft is ready here, hence the importance of marking the anterior surface because you can really readily uh, assess here that you don't have the full view of the graft. You really have to make sure that the graft is in the right orientation and lie in position and not twist them. Then to do the lateral wall, which typically I would do next, uh, I usually put uh, one stay suture on the pericardium, pull on that, and then we'll essentially, again, in line with the vessel to be grafted about three centimeters distally in the axis of the vessel, put the uh, armless starfish, which was an invention from uh, a colleague of ours, Kei Takikuchi, who learned mixed cabbage in Ottawa and it went back to uh, Japan and, and did many of those and, and, uh, and then came up with that concept, which is so much more intuitive than what we had to work with before bringing a retractor through the sub xiphoid region. One important pre uh, principle is really don't open the distal coronary vessel or so until you have good exposure and control. Uh, really, it's important. It's a little bit like a mitral valve. Don't start working on it until you have excellent exposure. So again, showing you the high res uh, version of this, you can see the LED here, and we're gonna put the uh, armless starfish onto the LED and expose the lateral wall in this case. So the lateral wall is there. Accelerate this a little bit, you can see the lateral wall there. So the armless starfish, uh, very high uh, technology here, NASA great technology of putting an umbilical tape around it and pulling on it, essentially, uh, it's almost like a garage shop, uh, but it works. Pull on this, make sure it's tight, it's wet, uh, and don't squeeze it too much because it'll break on you, and um, basically align it with the vessel to be grafted. So often one way to do this is to stop the right lung because you are on single lung ventilation. That brings the heart a little bit towards the right chest, gives you a little bit more room to put the armless starfish on, and then you restart the lung 20 seconds later. Uh, so uh, benefiting from that extra uh, space for exposure. So you can see here the, uh, the, the starfish is in line with the vessel to this marginal graft uh, to be performed. And now the epicardial stabilizer is there and we got a fantastic exposure. So this vein graft is gonna go on to the marginal in this patient. And essentially, once you're ready, uh, the grafting is almost the same as a regular off-pump surgery, essentially. Maybe a little bit, uh, you're obviously working through a long, narrow tunnel, 
uh, but otherwise the, the principles are the same and you can see how excellent the exposure is. So at the end, the completed graph here that looks really good. And, uh, you know, I've left many of those graphs too long. I was always afraid to have them too short. I've learned with time to uh, really be more circumspect around the length of the graphs. And now what I do is I, I make sure my orientation is right. I go to my target, I stretch by about one to two centimeters, and that's where I cut the graph. Um, so, um, um, it, they can be too long. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure if it's associated with poor uh, clinical outcomes. Probably not. But uh, uh, we tend to leave them too long because we uh, we're so afraid that they're going to be too short, right? And I, I think it's really critical to reinflate the lung and kind of the lie of every single one of your graphs to make sure that there's nothing kinked uh, by the lung or other structures as a result of it. So. The title really of this is what's, how can you learn less invasive cabbage or what's easy and what is not with regards to you trainees uh, and young faculty achieving this. So I think getting training is easy, either through uh, residency fellowship or peer to peer, uh, choosing the right patient, uh, because there are many of these patients around, uh, whether you're in, in Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Toronto or BC, there are many people walking down the streets with occluded uh, LEDs or anterior wall vessels or LED plus ramus who are not sent to surgery yet don't have a lot of PCI options and are having uh, angina almost every day uh, sold. As you start a program, these patients will be quite common. Taking down the LITA is easy, fairly intuitive. You just come from a lateral approach, but it's not that different from uh, what you as trainees are doing every day. Doing the LITA LED also is really uh, right in front of you. If in many ways, it's, it's as simple as doing it by sternotomy off pump. Uh, using the rule track and using the octopus stabilizer works well. And the beauty now in 2021 is that on many of these patients, let's say you, you wanna go in for three or four vessel bypass, you often have the option of having uh, hybrid coronary revascularization backup. Uh, so, for instance, on Monday, we had a um, Robert, Peter, and I had a patient from uh, re refer from Hamilton who came in and needed uh, three grafts performed uh, to three territories. Uh, now, um, there was maybe the thought that he would have had one graft at another institution and have a hybrid coronary re revascularization to the other vessel. So, you know, the patient had, did not have the best body habitus uh, to undergo this operation. But it went very well. But we always had in the back of our mind that had we not been able for, to graft uh, the far marginal and the circumflex artery, we could have uh, brought it to stenting. What's more difficult, really finding the right incision site, I think is very intimidating at first. And I still, um, from time to time, change uh, from one intercostal space to another. And again, I want to emphasize there's no crime in doing that. Uh, I used to explain it to my patients and say, well, sir, uh, you know, I had to go through two intercostal spaces. And what, I have two incisions? And, and ultimately the outcomes and, and the pain and the, the recovery of the patient was exactly the same. So uh, do not prevent yourself from doing the right operation because you feel that you have to go through two different uh, adjacent intercostal spaces. Uh, for instance, doing proximals and the PDA territory via the same site really requires in my opinion, one and one only uh, site for your incision. Uh, using the starfish is a bit more complicated, but now, thankfully, now that we have the armless starfish with the umbilical tape that I showed you, I think it makes it much more intuitive. Uh, doing far OMs is difficult. Patients who are fat, patients who have left ventricle hypertrophy uh, are difficult too. And getting to the next level of being able to essentially do it on anybody uh, who wants it. Um, is also obviously uh, the next level of difficulty. So I would say how to start with this operation, whether you have access to a robot or you want to do this conventionally, uh, the first aspect is really to get training. And I think it's essential that you can do off-pump surgery in your sleep uh, before you embark on this. Uh, this may be, I know there's a lot of debate around the true benefits of off-cab versus on-pump cabbage 
And I don't disagree with that debate. I think that habit, that debate is healthy. But in the same token, uh, off arm surgery is a pathway to something else. It's, uh, it does two things. It shows that you really master coronary surgery uh, to a different level, first and foremost. And second, it allows you to become less invasive. It allows you to explore non astronomy approaches. Uh, I often like to say no one who puts ice on the heart and has to stop the heart to do a graft will be able to step into this right away. The obligator, obligatory passage is really mastery of off-pump surgery by astronomy. So getting training is, as I said, there's quite a few modalities available, uh, and like the surgeon who, uh, it's not just a small surgery, it's actually, it's a small incision, but it's a big surgery in many ways. Um, choosing, I would say, when you start a male patient, uh, you don't have to uh, deal with smaller conduit size or, or breast tissue. Uh, although females do really well with this operation, I would say in some ways they're easier. Um, I find that their, their pain threshold is often higher, so they don't have uh, as much pale pain as male patients. Their tissues are also more flexible, and, and your ability to bring the exposure that you want in a female is surprisingly good compared to, to males. Um, you also want to consider and prepare for a hybrid revascularization backup with your team uh, who's doing this with you, your cardiology a colleague or and friend. Um, you should probably start with someone who has a small heart. Uh, Piroz and I use a chest x-ray simple criteria. You want someone with CT ratio of 0 0.5 or, or less, certainly no more than 0 0.5 or 0 0.55, because then one of the worst things when you get in a, in a chest through a small incision is when the heart occupies the whole thing and almost wants to herniate through a small thoracic artery, you know you're going to have a difficult time and, and it's going to be difficult to expose. If you come in and you have two, three centimeters between the chest wall and the heart, you know you're going to have a good time because you're going to be able to move that heart within the closed chest and do exactly what you want. A taller and thinner patient as for any operation, obviously, uh, are, are ideal when you start out. Uh, patients with a bit of a hyperinflation are great for this. Again, back to the CT ratio uh, consideration I was alluding to earlier, and it gives you more space and uh, exposure is easy. Uh, you probably won't have the privilege of starting with single vessel coronary disease. So you may have to pick some selected patients with two vessel disease, uh, like a ramus and, and an LED or something. Uh, if you want to consider grafting the right, make sure the PDA is adequate and do not hesitate to use bypass assistance. Uh, the next iteration of this is also robot. Some of you may have a robot at your center. Uh, you can do this robotically. There are pros and cons to doing that. We had a very grateful donor in Ottawa, um, Mr. McGarvey, who um, has agreed to uh, be recognized as such with his, his family's foundation who provided us with a robot uh, a few years ago. And, and so we have a robotic mixed cabbage program as well. So this is a, one of the, uh, what we call the, you know, bilateral uh, internal thoracic mixed cabbage from uh, March uh, in Ottawa with robotic harvest. Uh, it works really well. Uh, you have a beautiful operation where you take both mammary arteries without opening the chest with minimal blood loss, because if, as you know, if you have any blood loss with the robot, you can't even put a gauze in there. Uh, the only option that you have is to use uh, the patient's tissues, for instance, the pleura, to uh, tampon at it and wait that it stops. Uh, so it works really well, but it is, uh, it has pros and cons. For instance, uh, getting to the very top of the right internal thoracic artery is not easy. So we recently started using this mitral fan retractor that we put on top of the innominate vein so that we can get the retail all the way to the subclavian vein on the right side. So robotic obviously is more expensive, but it has a number of um, uh, advantages as well. There's no aortic manipulations. You end up with two ITAs. Ro the robot really mitigates obesity better because of the inflation uh, inside the, the chest. Uh, you have this beautiful retail LED, lethal circumflex configuration. It's clean, robust, and there's less chest wall stretching. And by freeing under the mediastinum, also your exposure is really uh, easy. On the other hand, it's obviously expensive. 
doing beta harvest is tedious, it's long. You almost have to consider that the patient, quote unquote, is not being operated because there's no blood loss, there's no pump, no nothing. That being said, uh, that is partially an illusion. The CO2 from the insufflation goes up. Often by the time you're done uh, two mammary harvests in a robotic patient, the PCO2 will be 68 or even 72. So your anesthesiologist, again, has to be fantastic in mitigating uh, those issues. Uh, as I alluded to, the top of the wreath is difficult. There's a learning curve and there's one extra hole compared to mixed cabbage. So uh, these are some patient examples. So this patient had three grafts, radial artery graft, mixed cabbage coming 30 days post-op, uh, sporting his decision and being a very happy, satisfied customer who, and patient who authorized us uh, to use his pictures. But it's not always that rosy. Uh, really, when you start a program, it becomes a bit of a societal a niche type of program. And this is, for instance, a patient of a close colleague and friend of mine who sent me this patient and said, you know, I don't want to do on me of this patient. He needs free grafts. And, and we went and, and we did it for obvious reasons. And the patient was very, very thankful. And perhaps you get the greatest reward from operating patients like this or patients like that. This patient also had a triple mixed cabbage perform. And obviously the wound is not healing in a this is not an LA uh, type of uh, uh, beautician healing here, but didn't have an infection, got through this and went back to, uh, to his activities uh, without having to compose with the invasiveness of sternotomy. So a little bit of evidence around this. Um, mixed cabbage was described first in 2009. This was our first report, uh, both from New York and Ottawa and this paper is really probably so far the most cited paper in, in the field. Uh, and about 10 years ago, about five years ago or six years ago, we celebrated the 10 years of mixed cabbage at the ETS. We had a bit of, a, of an event and people were excited, including the uh, animal kind who was uh, also partaking in the celebrations. And it's really been a wonderful journey uh, since then. In 2011, we published a case match comparison to journalomy off pump. Uh, of 300 patients who were matched on number of grafts and age and gender and, and the presence or not of pre-op LV dysfunction. So 150 mixed cabbage with speed in sternotomy. Essentially good results in both groups, but the main difference was the median time to return to full physical activity, which was only 12 days with mixed cabbage versus over a month with opcab. Uh, the proximal anastomosis uh, technique, which I showed you earlier was described in 2012 by our group. And then we also, uh, there were a lot of questions at the time as to whether the surgery worked. So we were compelled, Joe and I, to do a systematic consecutive angiographic patency report. So uh, we brought about uh, just shy of 100 patients uh, for this uh, and, and evaluated systematically angiographic patency at six months and essentially uh, found that there was a 91% patency at six months on CT with 100% patency of the lethal LED. And the beauty again with this operation is that the graph configuration is exactly the same as you would have with open cabbage. And you can see here this 3D reconstruction showing a lethal LED and two graphs, one to the PDA and one to the circle or the PA, as you can see here. Now learning curve has been an issue and we wanted to help tackle that. Many of you are, probably more seasoned educators than I can ever dream to be. Uh, but I think as a community, we have to help each other and take on this operation. And whether it's teachable or not remains a very relevant question. So uh, one way to mitigate the learning curve, at least with regards to operative time, is to use femoral femoral cardiopulmonary bypass uh, support during the operation. You don't need to cross clamp, but at least you can support the heart. And we showed at the time that uh, when you, we did a CUSUM analysis, those patients in whom uh, we used uh, CPB support uh, had no learning curve as opposed to trying to do everything off pump. And this is essentially a depiction here of the CUSUM analysis. I won't go in detail uh, over the figures, but it shows you that essentially using cardiopulmonary bypass mitigates uh, the uh, learning curve. Now, that being said, if you look in the upper figures at the operative time, essentially you remain long all the time when you do CPB because it does take 30 to 60 minutes longer when you go on pump as opposed to 
those times getting shorter when you keep patients off of. So it's a little bit of a, it depends on what way you interpret uh, the data, but certainly a way to be safe and probably have uh, more ease in performing this operation. So what are the new research questions? I think in my opinion, again, this is my own personal take on this, but I think there are three uh, remaining research questions. Is it widely diffusible? Uh, and I think, again, as I was saying, there's a great role of education and it starts with you guys. You guys are up front and center because our Canadian trainees are the very best and should uh, take on this operation. It doesn't mean that you'll be doing three graphs on 300 pounders uh, in two years from now, but at least you should be able to put a LITA onto the LED without performing astronomy. I, I strongly believe that. Um, the other research question is, is it robust and durable like cabbage is? And three, is it truly less invasive? So with regards to diffusibility, it's really catching on. As many of you know, there are many more centers now performing single vessel small thoracotomy bypass, which is one iteration of this. Uh, the hybrid coronary revascularization concept is catching on because that surgery is available as well. And there's about a tenfold increase in multivessel small thoracotomy bypass in, in several countries in jurisdiction, Japan, Chicago, Ottawa, now Toronto, uh, uh, Miami, Wisconsin, China, etc. cetera. Um, so a lot of uptake in pockets, uh, mind you, uh, but I think it's, it's, it bodes well for the future. Uh, we really try to have an international, international effort to teach this technique. And two of the countries that perform the most of these operations are definitely first and foremost, India. Uh, where I had the chance to go several times to do this operation. And Indian surgeons are absolutely uh, amazing and skilled and afraid of nothing, uh, as many of you know. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, I remember one day, we than two in a day, uh, I did a morning of four graphs uh, in front of probably 150 people in an auditorium watching every movement. And then I, I asked a surgeon, this guy there, um, I said, do you want to do the uh, Gopichal Manam? I said, do you want to do the afternoon? He said, yeah, no problem. Did four graphs in the afternoon uh, and didn't even go on pump and, and piece of cake for him. So I was very impressed by that. Um, and, and they're wonderful. And here you can see Gopi here uh, on, the, on this picture. So Japan also has been uh, quite an early adopter of this operation. This is the Sakakibara Heart Institute, which is the largest um, heart center in Japan, uh, about the size that an average Canadian center would be. So they do about... 1500 pumps uh my latest information per year uh knowing that japanese centers are typically lower volume uh, than north american centers but it was a wonderful experience and, and i want to show you this because this is one of my favorite pictures and when you go to japan you know when we're um we're, we're in canada we'll walk through the hospitals we'll see um you know workplace uh, inspection reports on the wall or this and that uh, fire extinguishers but in japan Every single corner of the hospital has those helmets because they're ready for earthquakes. And this is a standard uh, safety practice in Japanese hospitals, which is quite uh, striking to us. So if a big one comes in, uh, you put your helmet and, and you run for shelter. So again, really the privilege of operating with a uh, professor Takanashi in Tokyo and performing these surgeries uh, with him. Uh, and really that collaboration has been very fruitful because Kei Takikuchi, who uh, Piroz and I both know as a friend, has really been the one who came up, trained in Ottawa in 2012, has been uh, better than I am at doing the surgery, which is always the goal of someone who teaches something to you, that you, you become better than him or her, right? And, and Keita already came up with this uh, armless starfish um, principle, uh, which works really well, which we have now in turn uh, adopted. So last question, is it, robust and durable like cabbage, right? Um, or second question, we recently submitted and it's been accepted in Jack, uh, the 10 year outcomes after mixed cabbage in Ottawa in it, or consecutive series of 510 patients. And Ming, who I think is present on the call and Peter uh, were uh, the first authors of, of this series. And, and essentially the mean age was 64 years 82% of patients were male, 27% were diabetics, about 20% had depressed ejection fraction, less than 45%. We used pump in 16% of patients and we converted about 4% of patients. 
median number of graphs range between one and four for a median of two. We re-explored about 2% of patients and we had one death, unfortunately. I'll always remember the patient, uh, this elderly gentleman in his 80s was picking up his bags and, and I saw him, he was leaving and then he dropped dead in the corridor about half an hour later. We suspected uh, massive P, although the family did not consent uh, to an autopsy, but everything looked, uh, including the focus exam, uh, was pointing towards a PE. So the good news is that the operation is durable. Uh, we have complete follow-up, uh, Ming and Peter and, and Kenza and, and, and Kira and many others have worked really hard. I was, most years I've been bringing students in the summer to follow up on all our mixed cabbage patients. So we had this longitudinal analysis and it's been fruitful because we've been able to have complete follow-up on all of these patients. Uh, we even had a uh, staff call the police uh, in the two or three patients in whom we had no information and were able to find how they were doing and get in contact with the patients. So happy to announce that the survival at 10 years of these patients with a mean age of 64 years is 90%. And the vast majority of them are free from MACE, more than 81% are also free from any form of major adverse cardiac event or revascularization. So fantastic results. Obviously, selective patients, there's no doubt about it. Uh, selection on both sides, some amputees, as I was showing you, but many patients who would benefit from a rapid recovery after bypass surgery and make the most out of it. So last question, really, is it truly less invasive? There's still some skepticism, as this man is depicting here. Uh, as to whether a thoracotomy is truly less invasive. You know, that figure I showed you, that six to 12 months recovery time for cabbage, is it really going away if we avoid sternotomy? Well, we're going to find out. We now have a prospective randomized control trial. Ming, who's a beautiful picture here, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, is leading this uh, along with the rest of the team. And we have this international trial, which is essentially comparing sternotomy versus mixed cabbage for multivessel coronary disease. Piros is one of the investigators. Uh, there's many centers uh, in all, on all continents, except unfortunately Africa, which is not yet performing this surgery. Uh, and we're uh, very much looking forward to uh, analyzing the results of this trial. We're about halfway through the enrollment. The primary endpoint will be the physical component score of the SF36 at four weeks post-op. And uh, we need 88 patients per group, as I was uh, alluding to earlier. So we're at the end. This is important. This is a picture of our resident cohort, uh, a wonderful, talented people. Who, and it's to me, it's clear that you have to embrace some forms of non-sternotomy cardiac surgery. Uh, and coronary bypass surgery, you know, of the big fields of cardiac surgery right now, uh, heart failure, aorta, valve, and coronary, which one would you say is the most robustly demonstrated to be superior to medical or catheter-based alternatives? I think we would probably, many of us would agree that it's the coronary surgery field. So we have to make it less invasive. We cannot wait until there's yet another discovery or perhaps medical treatment is being proven because of the price to pay with regards to quality of life after sternotomy cabbage. Uh, we cannot wait until medical treatment or something else it, it is the cure and therefore denying all patients the robust benefits of undergoing cabbage. So I think it's absolutely crucial that we embrace this. Whatever you focus on as a resident, uh, it can be hybrid with a single, single lethal LED, or it can be multiple some mixed cabbage, or it can be being part of a robotic program and doing TCAB or SVST but you have to focus on some non-sternotomy approaches. Even probably more importantly so for coronary revascularization and valve revascularization. My, my friend and, and colleague and, and CEO of the Heart Institute tells me, well, minimal invasive valves don't matter because the true minimal invasive valves are TAVR and, and mitral clips. And he's not wrong. He says this in a somewhat uh, shocking manner, but he's probably right. We don't have the equivalent of mixed cabbage in the catheter-based uh, platform. So it's important to embrace it and develop it together. So I'll conclude by saying that it's a really mixed cabbage can be achieved by all of you, uh, by any dedicated off-pump five-cell cardiac surgeon and team. It's a fully 
teachable cabbage operation with astronomy. It prepares, you may want to move into a robotic cabbage program, but you don't need to. You don't need to have a robot to be less invasive. Uh, you can also team up with your cardiology colleagues and perform hybrid revascularization. And really, as a technical point, don't hesitate uh, to use cardiopulmonary bypass to help you. And lastly, again, I want to reiterate, non-sternotomy approaches are part of your future, whether you like it or not. And I kind of know that you all agree with that and you don't have any problem with this. So it's really been a privilege uh, this evening to be uh, amongst you and I'll be happy to entertain any question you may have. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ralph, for that awesome talk. Personally, um, I've really enjoyed both yours and then also Dr. Glenera, also from Ottawa Heart, uh, who gave our last uh, lecture series on total arterial because it's certainly two different uh, techniques that I just don't see in Edmonton in my training program. So I really appreciate it. Um, we will now open it up for questions. So if you'd like to raise your hand, uh, please do so. Or as of right now, there's no hands being raised. So if someone wanted to just unmute their mic, they can certainly ask the question. Um, hi, Dr. Royal. So we're up here. Um, uh, just a quick question. You, you know, you mentioned that before you can even attempt doing uh, a mini thoracotomy off pump cabbage, you really need to get good at doing sternotomy off pump cabbages, which of course I agree with. Um, the parallel to me is uh, one of the surgeons I was speaking to uh, spoke to Dr. Schaefer about, you know, doing valve sparing in a type A dissection. And he said, you have to do a hundred valve sparing in elective cases with zero complications before you can attempt a valve sparing at a type A dissection. Do you have a number like that in mind? Do you think, you know, if you have done these many off-pump um, sternotomy cases without strokes, without major morbidity or mortality outcomes, then yes, now, you know, you can start making your way towards a thoracotomy or a robotic uh, case? It's a good question. So uh, I don't know, let's pick a number. It's obviously uh, different for everybody, but maybe a hundred or so, hundred off-pumps and... Uh, you know, you start your practice, uh, you'll get there quickly. Uh, you know, the average Canadian cardiac surgeon does what between 150 to 200 operations a year. Uh, we still have a fairly favorable uh, cabbage contingent. Uh, so probably 50% of those will be bypasses. And, and if you decide that you want to move into something less invasive, I, I would, I would really recommend that you make uh, off pump your primary platform and, and become really facile. And it's going to make uh, any further attempts at becoming less invasive uh, much easier. Piros. Hi, Mark. You're on the camera. <laughs> yeah. Hi, nice How's to meet you. Toronto, my friend. Yeah, just getting settled. And uh, thanks a lot for the kind intro. And uh, it's nice to be on the Canadian scene. It's um, nice to have you with us. And just wanted to let everyone know, like, I don't know if Mark remembers, but our friendship started on the escalator uh, in Orlando in the AHA meeting where I went specifically to meet him uh, because I was supposed to do a live case in Leipzig Dallas meeting. And I wanted to take a few tips from Mark as to how uh, the grafting should be, can be simplified. So anyway, we've come a long way after that. And um, it's a pleasure to be on the same podium or on, at least at the same meeting as, as Mark. Uh, um, and we hope to actually take the program even further. Uh, basically, I think uh, the, what uh, we need to focus is on making this operation uh, easier. And um, I think one way of doing it is uh, developing uh, instrumentation uh, light source, et cetera, which would probably make the operation a bit easier so that it can be more diffusible as you showed it in your in your in one of your slides. Um, I think that will definitely uh, encourage more surgeons to get onto the bandwagon, which I think is extremely important because we need to go smaller and smaller and, 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 and more than smaller, it is a sternotomy sparing approach, which is more important. Um, I mean, a six centimeter or a seven centimeter, some of the surgeons do 
uh, fight about it, but I don't think that matters. It's more important to save uh, the sternum, um, which is important. Um, uh, just to add to the, I mean, the, to, to add another comment to the question that was asked that uh, regarding, uh, you know, learning curve, um, I think that uh, OPCAB is extremely important, uh, but as one does OPCAB, it is also not a bad idea to start doing the minimally invasive mid-cab, so that's the LITA to the LED, or the SVST as Mark, you call it, uh, simultaneously, uh, which uh, will help the uh, the learning surgeon to get accustomed to looking at the heart from the left side, which we are usually not, and also to take the LITA from the left side uh, rather than taking it from the right side. So I think uh, doing those two uh, things simultaneously once he has a, had, an, had enough experience as far as cabbage is concerned, uh, that would uh, accelerate or rather uh, shorten the learning curve. Um, that's what I sort of had the advantage in Leipzig because I, I used to do opcaps when I reached Leipzig, but uh, adding the mid cap really encouraged me or gave me the guts to go ahead and, you know, also do a multi vessel. That's just what I wanted to add. Great points, Jules. Thank you so much. So we essentially start with single vessel, right? That's right. Yeah. And don't wait too long and you know, choose carefully selected patients. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. One question we often hear, and you may have it, is, you know, what happens when you cannot find the LED? And that is, that is an anxious moment for sure. Uh, there's one thing I didn't say, but Piros and I both very much insist on this, is you need the antigram in the room when you're doing even a LITA LED because you can get fooled. Uh, I even got fooled once. One of these 510 patients is a patient. He was actually a, a study patient. We had him in a trial. Uh, and um, that was probably about four years ago. And, and this nice gentleman, we do a beautiful Lita. He was randomized to a hybrid. We had a bit of a hybrid coronary re revascularization in patients with diabetes trial. And uh, I grafted the diagonal. And uh, he went for a completion and geography the next day and the cardiologist calls me and says mark beautiful graph is absolutely perfect I'm like, well okay why are you calling me because well it's on the diagonal I'm like oh i'm so so i went to see the patient and um took him back to the or and um he was already on the ward he was almost ready to go home the next day and uh, we took him to the or and i disconnected the lita from the diagonal and put it onto the led it went perfectly. It was a textbook case. I remember Vince Chen, one of our colleagues, came and saw like what we were going to do with that. And he left the next day, and he was almost satisfied patient ever. He thought this was wonderful, and it was amazing that we were able to do this, and we disclosed everything to him. And so, and he's been doing super well ever since. Uh, but it does teach you humility. Uh, there's many diagonals, there's many conal branches that look like an LED. You have to positively identify that this is the LED. You have to look at each curve of what you have in front of you and compare it to the angiogram because you will get fooled in 500 and some patients. Eventually, you'll get fooled once and you'll remember and you'll tell the story like I am this evening. Fortunately, with great outcome. Mark, I have a, a, a short question. Sean Connor. Hi, Sean. No How plans. are you? Good to hey, see you. Thanks for joining I'm us. Good. The, uh, Mark, um, I think that being a cardiologist, I'm probably in the vast minority here in the group. So excuse my ignorance. But I, I was in a beautiful You're lecture. On your Thanks. shoulders, Sean. <laughs> no. And uh, Mark, I was wondering, you know, as we look at all these heart teams now and, and the robustness and the powerful uh, evidence that we have for uh, mammary onto the LAD, are there any trials in progress or planned clinical trials for hybrid approach? Do the uh, LIDA onto the LAD and hybrid approach stent the other vessels without doing full surgical grafting to the other vessels? Um, it, do we have any outcome trials that look at that the hybrid approach tested using a surgical approach, the IMA and stenting for the other hybrid vessels or the other vessels? So it's, it's a great question, Sean. And it's such a great question that the 
trial has been attempted and, and it was it's uh, now unfortunately becoming a bit of an famous or infamous trial, the hybrid coronary revascularization trial, which was planned for a couple of thousand patients. Uh, John Puskus uh, was the, the PI. And John is very sorry about this. And Greg Stone was the, um, uh, the cardiology PI. And, and the trial went on and went on and could not recruit. Uh, essentially, there were multiple reasons for this. Um, were there insufficient centers in the US uh, performing lethal AD? The comparator was not multivessel cabbage, but multivessel PCI versus lethal AD plus stenting, as you referred to. Uh, you could always say, you know, what's the control intervention? Uh, but the intervention that you described, Sean, I agree with you, requires to be studied. And it's not studied right now. There's only case series of hybrid. And, you know, the benefit of the lethal AD when you look at Excel, Freedom, Syntax, Noble, uh, et cetera, all the recent trials that have shown superiority of cabbage, if you were to tease it out, is it the lethal LED or is it the completeness of revascularization or is it the prevention of distal disease progression, which is essentially bypassed, no pun intended, by the presence of a distal anastomosis with a functioning graft onto the vessel? What is it? And really, you, you cannot mechanistically find the answer. So I think the trial that you described is needed. It failed. Uh, it was closed about, uh, I think, two years ago. The NIH pulled the plug on it, uh, but uh, to be continued. Yeah, I was impressed by the fact that, you know, you, you do describe that the lead to LAD is a, a very diffusible, teachable skill. It's, it's something that can be approached easily. And um, if minimally invasive surgery can eat, we can consider it as an option that's superior when we do that plus stent the other vessels that are stentable. And in the area of CTO or in the era of CTO, maybe many more vessels can be approached with stenting. Then maybe that's a viable option that we can diffuse to a lot more of our centers. I mean, I think it still takes a, a fairly sophisticated surgeon with lots of experience to do full grafting of all vessels through a minimally invasive approach. I think we need evidence. You know, the hybrid revask is a little bit like the CTO field that we need hard evidence, right? And, yeah. and we don't have it. Like the, what's the five-year outcome of a CTO vessel that's open? Um, I, I'm not always the most popular person when I raise those questions, but the CTO, it's not because it's feasible that it's going to work, right? And that's going to stay open or even if it stays open, that is going to mean that it will lead to meaningful perfusion. They're all different things, right? I agree with you. That research is needed. Sorry, it's probably the wrong platform to ask questions <laughs> from a cardiologist's point of view. But I was just wondering because the, uh, you know, and maybe in the future we'll get those answers. But uh, very impressive videos and techniques. Amazing uh, what we can accomplish through these minimally invasive. Well, thanks techniques. so much for uh, joining us and for your openness of mind uh, for <laughs> you and. I think Anne is on as well. And, and, and if any other cardiologists are here, it's really a, a great privilege for us uh, to host you. Thanks, Mark. All right, so are there any other questions from anyone in the audience? Doesn't seem so. And with the time of it being about 6.15 or 6 Edmonton time, I think we'll let uh, Dr. Ruel and everyone go for the evening. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to do our monthly webinars. And uh, thank you everyone for attending tonight. Um, your attendance is what keeps these events happening. And uh, we look forward to our next uh, lecture series, which will take place in September, which is going to be on, I guess, the basically off pump versus on pump debate. Thanks Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night.